Our next item is a departmental item, and it is the potential sites for the North Pleasant Valley Groundwater Desalter Project. Mr. Fox. Uh, yes, Your Honor, thank you. Uh, before I begin, uh, I just want to mention that uh, because the discussion tonight will involve property that's owned by the Oxnard Union High School District, uh, we do have uh, some representatives of the district that are in the audience, and I, uh, for your benefit, want you to be aware that uh, Dr. Gary Davis and Wayne Edmonds, who are both on the school district board, are in the audience, and then also uh, Joel Kirschenstein, who is a consultant working for the district, who has been our point of contact as we've worked up to this point on a potential partnership, is also in the audience. So uh, we welcome them and are glad, and we're glad they're here to hear this presentation because, of course, um, you know we'll be working with them as we go forward. The presentation also is a. Um, compressed uh, shorter presentation of one that we presented to a community meeting last week. Uh, we had great participation from the community. Uh, we were looking, uh, knowing that there's been a lot of questions associated with this project we wanted to meet to be able to have a, a much a greater opportunity to respond to questions than we have on a tight agenda tonight. So we were able to have a good discussion. And through that, uh, we've learned that there seems to be a real strong consensus for the recommendation that we'll get into through this presentation. Um, and then also, you have received a number of emails and letters from the community uh, on this item, too. And uh, that's in your, uh, that's been provided to you. And if you do approve this uh, action tonight, we will include it in the package of information that we would forward on to the Oxnard Union High School District so they would have all that information as well. So with that, I just want to lay out, um, you know, the item before you, and that is to consider uh, whether there's, uh, w what the uh, preference in the community would be is a preferred site for the desalter and uh, confirm that what we've been hearing so far is, it, is that site four, which is, and we will have a map that will show better where this is located uh, in the presentation, deeper into the presentation, but it's basically at the northeast uh, uh, edge of the uh, Rancho Campana High School campus. Uh, that is a site that uh, is really becoming the number one option, and we'll get into reasons why. Uh, there's a lot of positive reasons why this is uh, the preferred site. That if you agree uh, through the staff presentation and input from the community that it, uh, Site 4 does appear to be the best option, that then we would uh, request that you authorize staff to submit a purchase offer to the school district. Uh, that's just the beginning of a, of a process, though. Uh, the district would still have to, and as I use the word district throughout this presentation, I'm referring to the Oxnard Union High School District, and when I refer to board, I'm referring to their school board. Uh, the district uh, has authorized a uh, consultant to review the environmental document and review our project. Uh, that review has been submitted to the district, but they need to uh, go through that with their board first before they would be able to submit that to the city to be able to respond to any questions they might have. So we don't have the, the results of that to discuss tonight, but um, the early indication is that there aren't any red flags, there aren't any um, deal breakers, that it's more uh, probably clarification that we need to be able to provide. And of course the board would need that clarification before they could ultimately respond to the city's off um, purchase offer. So. Uh, more to come if you uh, authorize the action tonight. So some brief background. Uh, the aerial photo uh, on the screen is the center of the city. The area, and I think probably the easiest thing is to use this yeah. mouse arrow. So right here is the uh, campus, the uh, Rancho Campana campus, and uh, we'll get into a much closer view, but I just want to get you oriented as to where we are in the city. And then um, highlighting the two basins that are in or near Camarillo, the Pleasant Valley Groundwater Basin is where we pump our water from, and that's uh, underneath the center part of Camarillo and then extends to the west out into the Oxnard Plain. North of the city is the Las Posas Groundwater Basin, uh, north of the city limits that serves uh, parts of the county north of our city. So the area just highlighted in red is a uh, 
flow of surface water and, and some potential spillover of the Las Posas Basin into the Pleasant Valley groundwater basin of salty water. Uh, so we've historically had very good quality. I'm trying to find, there we go, I'm trying to find the arrow. The, um, Groundwater that we pump from has been good quality in the past, but uh, Cuyagas Creek is just off to the right part of the slide here, and that surface flow is uh, percolating into the basin. It's very salty, and it's contaminating the quality of the water, and this plume is a best estimate of a groundwater study as to where that salty uh, impact has already occurred and will continue to migrate further into the basin, causing greater impacts. This is probably the most concentrated area of the salt. The um, proposal is to construct a project to intercept that surface flow, um, or at least uh, intercept it at the part of the basin where it's uh, migrating into the groundwater basin, and then also draw it back and ultimately restore the basin to a higher quality water. And so the, um, the salter is actually fulfilling a regional role, a regional benefit, as well as a local benefit in creating a local water source. The, um, it's not just a good idea. We're actually required to do this. There's uh, what's referred to as a TMDL, a total maximum daily load requirement, which is a plan that was put together for this area that says that we have too much salt in the area and in the groundwater and we need to remove it. And, um, and so we're actually not doing this just because it's a good idea. It's actually we're required to do it as a regulatory requirement. The project is uh, intended to pump 4,500 acre feet a year. An acre foot is uh, one acre of water a foot deep. Um, three acre feet equates to roughly a million gallons. And so we would pump 4,500 acre feet, but in, through the treatment process, some of that is lost as we remove the brine. There is a pipeline in Lewis Road of, called a brine line that we would discharge the, the salty byproduct in, into the brine line, and that would be discharged into the ocean. The, the, the water discharge in the ocean is still less salty than ocean water, so it won't create any environmental impacts. The resulting uh, 3,800 feet that we would uh, produce of good drinking water each year is about half of what we need to serve our service area. The city water service area is about two-thirds of the community. We do have some water districts that serve the other third of the community. The uh, Fox Canyon Groundwater Management Agency uh, manages the, the use of groundwater and how much can be pumped from the basins. They are potentially interested in, in joining us later on in a second phase um, that uh, would allow us to expand the project up to 9,000 acre feet a year. That's what would be pumped. We would net about 75, 7,600 acre feet of drinkable water. Half of it would go to the city. The other half would go to customers within the, the west half of Ventura County. And there's no timeline for that. Um, just a, a factor that we're going to be looking at in design is that we want to have the project be easily expandable to accommodate a second phase if it makes sense. We are under a time schedule order, which means that we have a, a legislated or a, um, not legislated, but a uh, regulated deadline of having our plant built and operational by 2019. Uh, we're obviously getting laid into a schedule to be able to make that deadline. So time is of the essence. There's a number of issues that uh, through the discussions we've had with community uh, representatives, uh, the, the, the uh, representatives from the Oxnard Union High School District have heard as well. There's a variety of things that were identified in the IR. And I'm going to touch on the ones that I think were the, the high points that people had the most questions or concerns about. I'm going to come back to safety because we'll get in a little more detail on that. Uh, another concern was noise. The environmental document looked at noise based on what uh, a project of this type, a desalinization plant, uh, would look like if it was out in a uh, away from an urban area, where it's more typically the um, facility is just under a canopy; it's not enclosed, and so you have pumps that from the outside you can hear. But uh, we're proposing to house that operation inside buildings. You virtually won't hear the noise outside the building, so there is no noise impact. In fact. Some of these projects that have been built in buildings or 
uh, occupied buildings, they have an educational component where people can come and they'll have a classroom and a viewing area where you don't hear the noise. Once you open the door and go into the operations, then you hear the pumps and it's a little noisier. But outside the building, no noise impact. As far as light, again, if it was an outdoor operation under a canopy, you might have some of the light for the operation at night uh, spilling out to the edge of the property. But in this case, again, being housed in a building, the only uh, light will be what the ambient light needed for somebody to be able to walk around the site and it'd be directed away from the residential and school areas that uh, would not um, create an impact with light. I'm, I'm hitting on this and then again there will be an aerial photo and we'll point more to imagery that shows where all this will be created. Uh, no, no emissions. This is a project that's going to be using solar power and electrical electrical energy to power the plants so that uh, uh, there aren't any emissions. The um, water treatment process doesn't produce any emissions. There are no off-gassing or emissions that come from the project. The um, project has two to three uh, staff that uh, on a daily basis will come to the site. It's a very automated operation. And so the typical daily traffic would be about 10 trips a day, which equates to about equal to what a single family home generates. Most of those trips will be the employees and their vehicles come, going to or from the site. There will be supplies delivered to the site on occasion. That's not a daily or even a weekly. Uh, every several weeks a truck delivery will be made to the site. Um, however, uh, the, one of the opportunities that Site 4 creates is an opportunity to create access over to Lewis Road, and you'll see that when I show the aerial photo, uh, that can allow traffic to come in off of Lewis Road and not have to drive through residential areas to access the site. The uh, project is uh, intended to be designed in a way that will be compatible with the surrounding urban area. And, and all of these things that I'm listing, by the way, um, are regardless of wherever this project is sited, these are all uh, intended to be designed and dealt with the same way. The, uh, just to give you some imagery to, to give you an idea of how these sites can be designed to be compatible with an urban area, this is a similar sized project up in the um, Sacramento area that is right in a residential area, right between houses. And so the front building right here is where the uh, administration and some other operations are, are located. This is another view of that that's made to look like a house as you drive down the street. Um, it fits in and then going up the driveway, there's a larger building in the back made to look more like a garage and that's where some of the major part of the operation is located. The um, city is in the process of selecting a design team and uh, so we've gone through and interviewed several consultants. Uh, as part of their proposals, they recognizing that our project's going to be near an urban area, um, they, they built into their proposals what some imagery that they thought they could come up with to help uh, the, the project blend. And I'll show a couple examples of that. This is one that uh, is borrowing from some of the architecture in the area and trying to match some of the, you know, the Spanish style of Camrio architecture. And, and so this would be the administration building with some buildings off to the side for the operations. There would be other operations screened behind the building, but this is one example of how a project like this can be designed to, to blend. Uh, this is another illustration where they show a building up front that looks like a house that has the administrative and maybe some educational classroom components to it, and then a building in the back that screens the operations, landscaping in between. Um, we're, once we get in a design team engaged and, and they're ready to enter this part of their uh, design process, we will have outreach to the community to have their input so that it's something that you know blends with the area but um, also uh, blends with the community's desires. Uh, certainly, if um, we move forward with Site 4, we'll be sensitive to the proximity to the campus and work closely with the school district to try and match or, or have an architecture that, you know, blends with the campus and have landscaping and setbacks that, that help um, uh, uh, blend as well, and we'd be looking for their input in that design. So. Safety has been an item that uh, has been in the, you know, we've had a newspaper article, some letters to the editor, and other things that have um, uh, looked at safety from different views, some more accurately than others, that uh, I just want to clarify. And that is that um, we take safety, obviously, very seriously, just like everybody else. Um, 
you know, we don't want to create a project that's going to uh, place a burden on our community, that's going to put us at, a, at risk as far as having um, safety concerns to deal with. So we, we didn't take safety lightly when we embarked on this project. We've actually were, um, um, had uh, conversations with six different consulting firms, ranging from those that design to those that construct and those that operate these types of facilities to see if uh, there's something we're missing, if there's a safety issue we should be aware of. And the, across the board, it was a matter-of-fact response that this is a very high level of safety with these projects, very low level of risk, and I'll, and I'll explain that a little more. So, uh, um, you know, when we have consultants tell us something, we, you know, that's good information and it's helpful, but it's also good to look to see are there other ways to corroborate what we're hearing. And so a lot of that has to do with um, what is the experience in the industry that we've seen? And, uh, the, you know, is this, if this was the first project ever conceived next to an urban area, then, you know, I'd be concerned. But this is, a, water treatment is a common process and it's commonly located in an urban area. You have to go where the, the place these projects, where the water is, where the land's available, and where the infrastructure is available. So there's a lot of these projects that are um, cited, um, not only in, you know in California but across the country. Now I'll make a distinction. Uh, I'm going to make three distinctions, and I probably should have done this at the beginning. But uh, when we talk about a desalter, we're talking about a groundwater desalinization plant. So sometimes you hear about ocean desalinization, which are larger projects, uh, not as common because right now it's very expensive water that they produce. Groundwater desalters are smaller, and the um, water that they produce is. Um, more cost effective and, and so there's probably about 24 projects similar to what we're proposing that have already been constructed in California. Of those, uh, nearly half of them are immediately adjacent to homes or schools. There's a project that's about one and a half times the size of what we're proposing that is literally in the middle of a high school campus down in Santa Monica. So um, it's not at the edge, it's they literally students have to walk around the facility to get to the different parts of the campus. Uh, the um, State Department of Education has determined that placing a school next to a water treatment facility is perfectly safe and there are no restrictions to that. The, while desalters are, say, a newer solution that are, haven't been used as often as other types of treatment, it's only because they're now becoming cost effective. A lot of the uh, chemicals or the um, things that people may express a concern about with our project are the same chemicals and similar process that are used on treatment facilities that have been around for years in California and across the country. And there's literally thousands of treatment facilities. And, and we're just looking to operate this as a standard operation similar to what's been done time and time again. And so um, again, reaching out to the consultants, we asked are there any examples they can point us to of problems that have occurred with these types of facilities anywhere else. Not one problem could be identified. Very high level of safety, very very low level of any issue that has ever been documented. So obviously with very with no evidence of a problem and very long-standing evidence of, of success, um, you know, the conclusions everybody's come to is this is a very safe operation. Now chemicals are, um, again, probably the the area that people have concentrated on the most. We're looking to use a standard operation, um, you know, standard procedure basically, following what has historically been successful. There are a lot of factors of safety built in. Uh, the chemicals are, are chemicals that are used to treat water. They're common in an urban area. They're, um, a lot of them are chemicals people have in their backyard if they have pools or, or you know, in their home um, as far as cleaning supplies and so on. So these aren't, you know, um, chemicals that are, are foreign to an urban area. They're, they're common. They're stored in a way, the double-walled tanks. They have their own containment areas. There's, um, they have valves to connect hoses that are unique, so you can't connect, the, um, say, from a delivery truck 
uh, one chemical into the wrong chemical storage area because their, their holes won't connect to it. There's all these factors of safety built in so that chemicals can't be mixed. And they're also in solution, so these aren't pure chemicals. A lot of them are diluted in water, so um, the, there's literally zero probability that these chemicals will ever mix or create any kind of gas or, or issue. The, um, as I just said, no mixing. And then also, um, as I also mentioned, these, these again are common types of chemicals. They have names that, um, you know, are the sound, <laughs> uh, sound uh, kind of uh, foreign or that they're not common, but uh, uh, they're actually very common in urban area. And again, uh, examples of chemicals like uh, we're using, there's probably examples can be found that somewhere in the world a problem has occurred with those chemicals, but not in a water treatment process, not used the way uh, they are here. And actually in California, there's even extra layers of safety that compared to other parts of the country. So, you know, virtually um, as close to zero risk as you can get. So back to the illustration that showed the plume from before, the area just highlighted in gold. Um, that is the area that's been identified. There's really a very limited area that we can um, achieve the goal of the project, and that is to tap the salty water where and intercept it in the most uh, strategic location, and then to also extract the salty water and pull the plume back. So the groundwater study identified the area in gold is really our candidate area where the project has to be located. So zooming in, uh, that's basically this area right here. And there were eight, in the environmental document, there were eight sites that were identified as candidate locations. Once those were identified, then we had to start working with a whole myriad of regulatory and other agencies to, to identify of those eight which ones um, you know, can, can ultimately meet the test for every agency. Four were eliminated because of conflicts or other issues. And so we're down to four locations that are basically el eligible sites that we can look at. Um, three of those are located on the property highlighted in gold, and that's the property owned by the, the district. And the, again, the campus is located right here. Um, just to kind of help illustrate the proximity, we have the Country Lane neighborhood uh, here, and then we have the Vista Camrillo area here that looks out onto this area. Site one is not on the school property, that's on property owned by Bell Ranch. And um, site two was identified as the preferred location uh, in the environmental document. That was primarily because at the time um, uh, th there was some question as to whether Site 4 could be located in a way that did not interfere with potential expansion of the campus. However, um, as we started uh, um, hearing concerns about Site 2, Many of the concerns are generated because, uh, you know, the, these residential areas had pretty much been out on their own, away from a lot of urban development in the past, and then the library came in, the school came in, now the library's expanding. They've had a lot of construction around them. Uh, it feels kind of like the world's closing in on them, and we, and we understand that concern. And then to add another project on their other side uh, of their community, just felt like it was it was closing in and could we find a better site. And so as we approached the um, Oxnard Union High School staff to, to relook at site four, I have to say they were um, uh, very problem solving, solving oriented and we were able to work with them in a way to uh, shape the site so that it was uh, east of their campus and left room for the future expansion of a campus. But in doing so, we identified some synergetic relationship and benefits that really make Site 4 the better option. And so um, getting in a little more detail into that, but before I do, I just wanted to point out um, by moving from Site 2 to Site 4, this creates an opportunity uh, where we can follow this farm road. There's a bridge here out to Lewis Road, and then in the future we could bring access to the site directly from Lewis Road and not have to come as much through the community with um, deliveries of, of chemicals or supplies. So now uh, z zooming in on site four and, and talking about, as we really looked at site four and started to identify benefits, we realized this probably is a preferred alternative to site two. One benefit is that uh, 
the um, this is roughly five acres, and most of the operation will be up in the area um, to the north end of the site. We're looking to put a solar park uh, and power the plant with solar power. That would be mostly located at the southern end of the site. Um, the operations would be about 700 feet away from the closest building on the campus, so it would be quite a distance. But we want to create an educational element, and there's some real opportunity for that, so we would site the administration building closer to the south end of the property so that students could walk over. There would be a classroom um, and an opportunity for them to learn about water treatment, infrastructure in general, and whatever else we can build as, a, as an educational relationship between the city and the, and the campus. The um, school district owns, by the way, again, this is outlining the school district property. Is This is the north boundary. This is the east boundary. They own a well right at the north boundary, and that well produces more water than the district is able to use. They're under the same restrictions we are. The Fox Canyon Groundwater Management Agency only allows you to pump so much water. That well has more capacity than what they can use. So as part of the purchase, um, we would also buy rights to use half the water from that well. It's water they can't use, but we can. And so um, that creates a, a revenue source for, the, for them as well as an opportunity to you know, share the well and, and manage it together. The, um, I mentioned the fact that we would use solar power. Well, because of the proximity to the campus, if later on in the future the um, school district ever wants to uh, provide solar power for their campus, there's a way we could maybe join for economies of scale, and they could build off of our project to, to expand the solar power output and use it for their campus. Nothing that they have to commit to, but it's an opportunity for them if they ever want to consider in the future. The buildings um, that we're going to build are, are um, you know, obviously going to be buildings that have to be around for a while. They have to last at least uh, 25 years, and, and the project is designed to be a 25-year project. Unlike a lot of projects that are intended to go on forever, this is a cleanup. Uh, it's, it's removing salt from the water. When that mission is complete, our project um, approval from the GM Groundwater Management Agency ends. We're not allowed to pump good water from this area. We're only allowed to pump the poor salty brackish water. The estimate is that in 25 years, particularly if the GMA joins us with a second phase, is we will have pumped all of that water and the project will end. At some point there will these, be these buildings next to the campus that we've designed to match the campus and it will be a, uh, an asset with a very low salvage value and perhaps an opportunity for the district to build, you know, be able to purchase some buildings at a very, very good price. And then finally, um, again, our water quality in the area and as um, a uh, speaker earlier tonight identified, the water quality is com continuing to diminish. We have high salts in the water. And if we don't um, solve the problem, our water quality will continue to diminish. The school district does receive water from the city as well, so um, they will be just like all of our other, our other water customers that as we uh, improve the water source and not only the quality of water but reliability, it's a local source that we will control. So if we're ever cut off from state water, we still have a water source locally. The district benefits from that just like all of our other water customers. So um, if you do approve this item tonight, uh, we would make the offer to the district. Obviously, there would need to be some time on their end to consider it and respond back. Our hope is uh, that they can do that timely because, as I mentioned, with our time schedule order, we're, we're really tight on schedule and out of time. And we would hope that we can get an answer back by August so that we can wrap up the deal and, and finish the land purchase in September and that um, we would begin this summer design so that we would be completed with design um, by this time next year, go into the bid process which takes several months and then um, start construction in the fall and be completed sometime in 2019. So that's uh, you know the major milestones and with that I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions for staff at this point in time? No? I think we've all heard a lot about this project I do have for that. many years. It's, many years. It's shifted from one area to another, but we've heard about that before. And I think most of our questions have been answered in the past. I do have 
Mr. Morgan has a question. We have, you know, we, there's two things you talked about that um, may need a little more explanation. The, the, we've lost two wells in that area because salt intrusion into our drinking water from that buildup of brine water. We've lost a well and so has Pleasant Valley. Um, that, am I not correct, Mr. Fox? Uh, essentially, yes. So uh, we have two wells that historically produced uh, majority of the groundwater that we pumped uh, for the city, and the increase in salts mean that means that we now have to blend that water more with state imported water to to meet our water quality standards. So we're down to probably less than 20 percent of our historic production at those wells. So they're not completely turned off yet, but they're getting close and. You are also correct that with Pleasant Valley Mutual, they're experiencing similar issues, and and they're ha and they're looking at uh, building a similar, not sized project, but uh, dis uh, desalinization or desalter as well for their. Um, so the more and well. more the brine water pours in from Simi Valley or from that direction, mm -hmm. the more and more pours in, the our chances of losing more water or all the water, is there. The uh, that's absolutely correct. That uh, in the near future we won't be able to use our wells at all, and just uh, um, is a, I guess, a point of comparison to appreciate the value of groundwater. Is we pay about three hundred dollars an acre foot uh, for groundwater. We pay thirteen hundred dollars an acre foot for state water. So if we ever lost our local water source, our water rates would go up significantly. And again, we would not have a local source. Um, so if we were ever cut off from state water, we would literally be out of water. Yeah, one more question. Because you, you hit this briefly. Some people may, may not understand what you meant when you said cut off from water. Well, predictions are that there's going to be a break in the delta. Could be any day or could be but within 30 years. If that delta cuts off and we don't get any water coming with the aqueduct, it could be three months to three years. That's our secondary water. I mean, that's our water we're drinking. And if that happens, we could be without water for a long time. And there's only six months supply in the reservoir and so on. Um, so it is a very big problem that we have to look at potentially happening here. Is that uh, right, Mr. Yeah, that is correct, and thank you for the clarification. And I will mention that, um, yeah, my presentation, well, might be too long for some people. I did try to keep brief, and, and I mm -hmm. did not go into as much detail because I recognize a lot of faces in the audience, and they sat through a 45-minute presentation hearing a lot more detail on this, and I was trying to be somewhat respectful of everybody's time. These so are just too important I, things, I, I will, I, And I, I appreciate that, and I will look for your guidance as well as the community through questions to, to let me know what detail to drill, drill down on. Thank you, Mr. Fox and Mr. Morgan. Mr. Kildee, uh-huh. Tom, just to reiterate for me, uh, we are on a pretty significant timeline here. Is that correct? Uh, that is correct. We, we essentially are out of time. Uh, we are going to have to go to the Regional Water Quality Control Board and ask for an extension, and there's only so much time they will grant in the extension. So literally every month counts at this point, and we need to get into design and have a site identified in short order. Thank you. That's all and can you clarify something? You just made the comment about the cost of water, groundwater versus imported water. Now, um, am I correct when I say that even the cost of pump of the desalt de plant and the pumping of this water, the cost of that water still is equal or less than imported water? It's uh, not that, as cheap as groundwater, obviously. That is correct. So there's really two benefits of of the well. There's more than that, but two benefits I'll touch on with the desalter. There's the ability to produce a new water source, but the cost to do that is essentially the same or slightly less than buying uh, imported water from the state. So there's not a real savings there. Where the savings comes from is it also, the second benefit, is it protects our wells in the west end of the city, which if we don't intercept this water, will eventually migrate over, contaminate the water quality there, and we'll have to shut those off, and there won't be anywhere we can pump the cheap groundwater. We plan to continue to pump our full allocation at the west end of the city that is the $300 per acre foot as long as the quality stays, stays strong, which it should as long as we can move forward with this project. Thank you. And then we would have the right reliability if indeed we had a problem with the imported water, the access to it. Any other questions? 
at this point in time. We do have a few speaker sheets, and I know that, um, as you mentioned, we did have a, a wonderful, um, I think, a town hall meeting. Um, Mr. Fox did a great job and lots of um, questions and had a pretty full room at the library. So I, I thank everyone for coming out, and hopefully most of their questions were answered. But we do have a few sheets, uh, speaker sheets tonight, and we'll start with Phil Hamilton. And after that, uh, Sherry Moraga. Oh, you're done. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Phil Hamilton. Um, I didn't actually know if I'd actually speak. I just put the sheet in case I needed to. But I did just want to say thanks to council and thanks to staff for your efforts to uh, answer our um, concerns about the project and educate us to the necessity of it. And uh, so we're kind of supporters of the project now. And I think for Country Lane, although I can't speak for them because they didn't authorize me, I think I've only heard a couple people um, not want site four, but they didn't want any site at all. So uh, we're down to site two or four, and uh, I think we're all in support of site four. Great, thank you very much. Um, Avita Kunki. Good evening, my name is Avita Kunki, and um, I want to thank everyone for um, your response to our concerns and the fact that time was taken out to have a meeting and address those things for us. Um, a lot of things were cleared up and brought to light for us that we were able to kind of come back to our community and, and discuss and, and have a clearer picture of what's going on. So, um, you know, all of this having been explained to us, we uh, certainly still are opposed to Site 2 um, because we just feel that it's not a project that's appropriate to put in our residential area, um, especially with the history of our, our community and how we've been boxed in uh, where we currently live um, and we're running out of uh, space for just our, our homes. So, uh, but I do wanna say that um, with the clarifications that were made as far as the safety uh, uh, with the plant, um, we do uh, support, and again, I can't speak for everyone, but the general consensus really in our community is that we do support Site 4. We think that that would be an appropriate site to put this project, and we do see uh, a lot of benefits in, in putting that project there, um, and especially, you know, the school being open to it, uh, the access road coming from Lewis Road and not driving those trucks or, or those vehicles through our residential community, um, the space that that will create between the plant and where the hospital is. Um, all of those things we think are really wonderful benefits and so we are uh, in support, um, at, at least the large majority of us in support of Site 4. So thank you again, um, Madam Mayor and the Council and Mr. Fox for taking the time to address our concerns and for finding this alternate option that really looks like a really good option to us. Thank you. Thank you very much and thank you for working with us. Um, the last sheet is Joel Kirchenstein. I may hope I got that right. If you'll state your name for the record, just. Joel Kirschenstein, uh, Madam Mayor, members of the council. I'm here on behalf of the Oxnard Union High School District. And first of all, I certainly want to thank your staff. They have been very forthcoming, very deliberative, and uh, giving the district any and all information that they have including meetings and presentations, and their cooperation is, uh, has really been excellent. Uh, I'd like to just clear up a few, a few items regarding the speed of the process. The district, uh, for the most part, just found out about the shift from the one site to the new site just a few weeks ago. And they did take immediate action from the standpoint of doing what they have to do to meet their fiduciary responsibilities as a school board and as elected officials. And one of the items was we recommended that they secure an impartial uh, analysis from an environmental consulting firm, which they did immediately. And we have that review and that will be passed on to staff at the end of the week. And uh, I have gone over some of those items. And in addition to that, I think from the standpoint of the speed of the process, Unfortunately, we're hitting July, and the school board is dark in July. That's why it jumps to August. And I know the council has similar issues in the summer as does the state legislature. So 
So there's the, we do have that consideration. So the board is in the process of reviewing it. They're, they've had comments. They will discuss it on the 26th, I believe, of this month. Uh, I'll be present at that meeting. Now, having said, uh, dealing with the process itself, and also the board wants to be good neighbors, but they're also the stewards of the wealth of the welfare of the students. So that's the balance, and that's all that this is, is a balance between the board and their responsibility to the educational climate of the district. The Tetra Tech study, if I can go oh, on please. a little bit, yes. okay, and I'll, I'll be brief on the rest of it. The Tetra Tech study did, inc did include aesthetics, air quality, greenhouse gas emissions, hazardous materials, water resources, noise, and transportation, and circulation. For purpose of tonight, and Mr. Fox has done an excellent job, with the fact that we have two board members present, I'm wondering if you could just reiterate two points. And the most important points, I believe, for the district are, again, the safety of the students. And I think if we could reduce the safety to neighborhood terms, student terms, teacher terms, if Mr. Fox could explain what happens when the chemicals arrive at this facility, where they go, how they're stored, what happens to the waste when the chemicals go through the filtering system, how they're removed and how, they're, how they've gone. So we have more of a practical approach. And then the other point is the traffic. There's no real issues on the amount of no. traffic. The question is where do the chemical, how, how often do the trucks carrying the chemicals come through and pass through the system to get to the, uh, to get to the facility? So those are the two, the general comment that, that when they get the report is some of your consultants' uh, analysis applied to the other facility, and I'm sure they can update that very quickly and apply it to this particular site location. It didn't all line up. Mm -hmm. That's just because this wasn't the location that was focused on. So that would conclude my comments, and again, if Mr. Fox, who has been, uh, again, a uh, pleasure to work with, can go through those, two, those few points, we'd appreciate it. Thank you. thank you, and thank you very much for working with us and trying to solve all this. Could I ask a question? I just oh, ask we have a question, question for you, Hello? if you don't mind. <laughs> One question. One question for you. Uh, you did hear about the um, facility similar to this that's on the grounds, that they have to walk around at Santa Monica High School? Oh, I'm, I've done a fair amount of research and uh, familiar with that facility. Uh, I think there's a country called Israel that has many, many desultor plants all you over got the it. Thank country. You. So, yes. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Fox. Yeah, first of all, I do want to echo as well the, uh, the relationship has been a wonderful relationship working with the, the district staff. Um, again, this, we wouldn't have got to this point without their willingness to roll up their sleeves and be problem solvers and help us really look at um, how we can make this a project that benefits both agencies and that um, it's a can be an example of how two public agencies can work together to create something better that one agency on their own wouldn't be able to achieve so it's been a great relationship and and um, it certainly wasn't intended to suggest uh, when I was talking about a tight schedule and deadlines it wasn't to suggest that in any way the district you know was was um, responsible to try and and worry about our schedule it was just more of to highlight the fact that we, we unfortunately are at a limited point in time with uh, not too much time left to, to work out a solution. But we certainly have to respect that, you know, they have a process they have to go through. And a lot of the work has been at the staff to staff level. And we understand through the Brown Act, there's only certain opportunities for them to communicate with the board and they need time for that to happen. And we have to respect that, you know, they need time for that and schedules only allow so much. So, um, to respond to the specific questions, I'll take the traffic uh, item first, since that's the easier one and I can warm up. <laughs> that's your territory. The, uh, yeah, and uh, the um, truck trips are probably every few weeks there's a trip. They, these are not daily deliveries. Uh, the chemicals can be delivered and are stored for maybe a couple months, and, and so as one chemical area um, needs to be replenished, then a truck delivery will occur. But the truck deliveries will be very infrequent um, uh, to the point where probably won't even be noticed. The, um, again, to uh, 
trying to figure out the best way without shining a laser in Joe's eye. Uh, but uh, again, this farm road just off the, the map here is Lewis Road. And so the idea is that the truck deliveries, albeit infrequent, we also want to try bringing in a route that has the least need to work its way through a campus or around uh, a community. And if we come off Lewis Road on the farm road, they can continue up to the site without ever really getting close to, to the campus, not having to go through the campus or, or through the neighborhood. So uh, the route itself would be uh, off-site and would, again, accommodate very infrequent truck trips. So hopefully that uh, addresses the traffic concern. As far as the chemicals, and uh, I'll wrap up by having Ms. Mrs. McGovern come up to respond to how the waste is carted off, because she's the expert on these, uh, these issues. And I do want to acknowledge Lucy as well. In fact, I noticed uh, when uh, one of the speakers mentioned my name that a lot of the people in the audience have worked closely with Lucy, and they looked back to make sure she was they were acknowledging her too, and I want to acknowledge her as well. That you know, Lucy's been um, the the cornerstone of this effort since the beginning of the project, and and um, certainly deserves recognition. Um, but I'll start out by saying that as the chemicals are delivered, they're stored in tanks that are um, not just you know a typical tank that maybe you see um, in you know in in some facility where you see a tank outside that's full of a chemical that you can see the chemical sloshing around. This is, these are very solid tanks that are double walled, so the ability to penetrate or, or damage the tank in a way that the chemical could leak is you know, virtually impossible. Um, obviously, there's always something that's possible, but the risks are extremely low. They're anchored in a way, so in earthquakes, uh, they're not going to tip over. They're not going to fall off their foundation. They're, they're a solid reservoir that isn't going anywhere and isn't going to be compromised. Now, again, in case that very low probability happens that somehow chemicals were to get out of that storage area, there's a containment area around it. And that chemical is off by itself um, in its own containment area. And then other chemicals are in their storage area in a different containment area, kept far enough apart that there's no way those chemicals are ever going to um, get beyond their containment area to ever mix with other chemicals. So physically, there's no way for the storage of those chemicals to uh, be compromised and mix. So then it leaves operator air. Is there a way somebody can inadvertently take chemicals from one tank and put them in the wrong and it inadvertently mix them with another? And it, through, again, a lot of fail-safe measures, there's no way to do that. Now, how are these chemicals used? These, again, are chemicals that, while they sound you know, like they could be very dangerous, in reality, they're chemicals we put in water. They're being mixed with water, and some of them stay in the water, but obviously mixed at such minor um, percentages that um, they're, they're creating a benefit, not a detriment. And I'll give you an example. Um, water that we pump from the ground has bacteria and other um, you know, um, viruses and things that you don't want to drink. We need to kill that and, and um, treat the water. So we have chemicals that are put in that stay in the water so that that happens. We also have, through the RO, the uh, reverse osmosis process, which is the treatment that um, takes the salty water and turns it into good drinking water, those membranes are, are sensitive and can be easily uh, clogged up or damaged by the raw water coming in unless that water is treated to a level that doesn't damage the membrane. So you hear things like the acidic level or the pH water, um, we have to change that pH to a level that um, works as it goes through the membranes. And so there's a process where we're adding chemicals to change that pH. As the chemicals come through, um, then we have to change the pH back, so we put another chemical in that counters that. It, it's still water that's very safe to drink, actually safer to drink, because it's now been treated and cleaned. And But those chemicals aren't being dumped into the environment, they're staying in the water, and, and again, they're safe to, to consume, and in fact, um, are, again, this isn't a new or different type of chemical process that is new and unique to Camarillo. It's been used for decades around the country and is, has been proven to be a very successful way to treat water. So this is business as usual standard practice for treating water. Um, we're not cutting edge and trying something new here. 
However, there may be, and this is where I'll have Lucy come up, if she could speak to, are there any chemicals that do go to waste and how are those discharged? Um, we do are connected to the um, sewer system, and if there are any that need to be discharged, I would imagine they go into the sewer system. We have other industrial users in the community that discharge chemicals that have to meet certain discharge requirements, but go into the, the waste system and we treat them in our treatment plant, and again, the chemicals are, are dealt with that way and don't create any harm to the environment. But um, Mrs. McGovern, if you could confirm for us that, uh, you know, is there any chemicals that go to waste? And before you do, you don't have your picture of the tanks with you tonight? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, Tom did a very good job. I, I guess you're, I, you're, you're finally training him, yes, right? I, I, I've been saying it for so long that I think he's getting it. I will, he will become a treatment operator soon. So. Just for the public's sake, could you state your name? Lucy? Okay. Uh, my name is Lucy McGovern. I'm Deputy Public Works Director for the city. And I'm in charge of water, wastewater, and stormwater quality uh, for the city. And um, so anything to do with water is what I've been dealing with my entire career and just wanted to uh, state that. But definitely, uh, he's, he's a really good that. student. <laughs> 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 so... Um, Tom talked about uh, the chemicals that are used. Uh, they're all very helpful in uh, two, two things that we want to do for in the treatment. And one of them is uh, removing salts. And the other one, but before we can remove salts, we actually have to prepare the water in order to remove the salts because the membranes are pretty, uh, um, very sensitive to any harmful um, uh, minerals in the water. <clears throat> so the pretreatment is uh, intended, our, our, water, our groundwater is naturally uh, high in uh, iron and manganese. Iron and manganese, when it's in uh, solid form, can clog up the membranes. So our pretreatment process is, is intended to remove the iron and the manganese. And what happens in the pretreatment is the filtration, and uh, part of the the, uh, the iron and manganese that is removed is then uh, uh, there's a, um, that solution of iron and manganese then is treated and ultimately goes into the sewer. So that iron and manganese, it's kind of like a it's it's highly concentrated in iron and manganese. The bugs in the uh, wastewater treatment plant actually uh, is food for for them. So uh, that part of it is is uh, additional food for that for and mm -hmm. helps in the uh, wastewater treatment. So that so that water then that is free of iron and manganese then is <clears throat> prepped for uh, the reverse osmosis, and that means it includes uh, adjusting the pH which is one of the chemicals that are needed to uh, make sure that the pH is lowered and actually help in uh, going through the reverse osmosis. The reverse osmosis then removes all the, the dissolved minerals in the water, and one of the waste streams that is, comes out of that is the salty, all the, you know, all the dissolved salts, and that goes into the brine line. So about 80% of that water is pure, um, almost distilled water, and the rest of the brine line, though 20% or 15%, goes into the brine line, and that ultimately gets discharged into the ocean. Um, the reverse osmosis water, or the, the free, you know, the, the mineralized, demineralized water, is then readjusted for pH in order to, to make it viable and then disinfected. So these adjustments that you're doing for pH are needed, chemicals are needed. You also need chemicals for disinfection. So those are the chemicals that are needed. I'm not sure if that answers the district's questions and there's any other additional questions on it. Maybe you can tell us what the chemicals are that you use to do those processes. So the first set of um, pH adjustment that's needed is uh, sulfuric acid. Sulfuric acid is in liquid form. 
it's, um, I think I believe it was like 13,000 gallons of a, approximately a 30 day supply of that. So the second um, set of, oh, there's also uh, sodium hypochlorite, which is used for disinfection both on the pretreatment process and also at the end of the, the process. So that's the sodium, uh, sodium hypochlorite. We have uh, bisulfite. So any water, sodium bisulfite removes any chlorine that's first injected prior to the RO and that's also needed in order to protect it. And then uh, there's also aqueous ammonia to help in the ultimate uh, disinfection. And um, there's some anti-scalants that are used to protect the, the membrane. So there's about five or six, or I think I might don't know if I missed all of them or not. Great. And if I might, um, I have a sheet here that asks some questions, and let me see if you've got them all. Um, it says, where will the treated water with chemicals be disposed of? And I think you address you address oh, yeah. that one. And where will the pipeline be located from plant to the to of uh, the ocean? I'm assuming they're talking about the brine line. Does anyone remember how far out in the ocean it goes? It's quite mile? a ways. Mile? Way out. Uh, mile. It's a mile out over in Port Ranimi. Mm -hmm. And it's about 500 feet deep. So someone was worried, I know, at our town hall meeting about the wetlands and so forth, but this is way out in the ocean. Right. And at the end of that outfall, there's like a f fingers that are actually disperses the water probably another uh, 200 feet. <clears throat> Good, okay. Um, and the other question on, on here is where did the salt plume originate? And I think you touched on that earlier, but you might just... Mm -hmm. I. Yeah, it, it's a, a variety of sources. So there's surface flow that comes down Cayugas Creek um, in the Royal Simi. Uh, some of that surface flow is natural runoff when it rains. And, and the runoff, uh, because this is an area that used to be under the ocean, um, there's a lot of salt in the ground. And the runoff leaches salts and, and concentrates it as they flow in the creek. Uh, there's also treatment plants uh, in Simi Valley and along the Cayugas Creek, Moore Park, that discharge, and those are concentrated salty water. So the surface flows have more salt um, per unit than, than the natural water in the, in the groundwater, so that's uh, one source. The basin north of the city is the Las Posas Basin, and that is actually also high in salt. That basin is becoming... Uh, the quality of water in general is, is lower than the good quality water in Pleasant Valley Basin, and so, some of that is spilling over. By spilling over, you're, it's not something on the surface, but underground there seems to be some connectivity where some of that salty water from the Las Posas Basin is migrating into the Pleasant Valley Basin, which is why we need to extract the salty water. We need to go to the to the basin itself to accomplish that. It's not something we can intercept at the surface. We have to intercept in the groundwater basin itself. So, Question. Mr. Rogan? A couple of things. The majority of that water comes from Simi Valley because they're pumping water into that creek every day because the brine water level is so high that it goes through the si used to go through the sidewalks, little white stuff. And they don't have wells there to drink. They use imported water mainly. Right, Joe? And another thing, if you're going to like, if you like Dasani, you're going to like our water. It says purified, right? But back here it says purified through reverse osmosis. So we're going to have good tasting water, good water through this process. And, and the odds are that some of these chemicals we were talking about exist in those bottles of water. So, so I remember when we had our test site and, and you gave us some water that, that was so distilled it didn't taste right because it hadn't had that last process right. added back to it. And yeah, it was, um, I don't know what you call that water, but it was just... Plain, bland. Plain. Bland. Yeah, I wanted, it's bland. not just clean, but it's just, yeah. But it was good. Really distilled, I mean, yeah. Um, I wish you had your picture of the tank, but if the way I would explain it, I mean, they're big, they're tanks, but they're, they're the double wall, but then there was like a moat around them so that anything that... Containment area. That, yeah, the containment area is a pretty good size, mm -hmm. and then spaced um, so that even mm -hmm. if that was 
the, it couldn't overflow into each other. Right? That's correct. Yes, right. and in fact, the photo and part of the reason we didn't show it is that was of a different project up in the, I believe, the San Luis Obispo area where they actually did have the containment areas next to each other, so there was maybe just a wall in between. In our case, the containment areas will even be further apart with more space in between, so um, even more factor of safety than what the photo showed. Perfect. I think that answered the questions. Is there anything else, though, that we can answer? And um, gladly, I'll ask the um, school board members out there if there's anything you want to ask. Now's a good time. No? Um, that is the last of the speaker sheets I have, the last of the question sheets. Is, would anyone else like to address the council? Come on up. You state your name for the record, and then you can fill the sheet out for Jeffrey afterwards. We're all getting to know each other We're on a first name basis because we've spent some time together now. So, my name is Brian Chung. Um, I'm a resident of Vista Camarillo. Uh, based on what the representative from the school board said, it sounded like uh, their most their concerns and questions were mostly about safety, which I feel like uh, the staff has addressed. But um, I just wanted to come here and explicitly and express my support and I think um, based on the comments and the feedback from the community uh, meeting in the library um, I think Vista Camarillo overwhelmingly is in support of site 4 and um, I also want to thank uh, the mayor and the city council the staff including uh, assistant city manager Tom Fox um, for uh, listening to our concerns and um, trying to work with the school board. And we really appreciate all the effort that you've done so far. And um, I think that's about it. All right, well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you all. And we do appreciate all of you. You've taken the time to, you probably know more about water now than you ever wanted to know. But, uh, and tonight you learned what happened in the treatment plant, that there's little bugs that like to eat the chemicals. So, <laughs> so, so welcome to our world. Uh, it, um, that is, again, the last of the speaker sheets. Would anyone else like to address the, the council? Any questions or comments from the council? Mm -hmm. Time for observations? Absolutely. Okay. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, first of all, I'm fortunate to have attended the recent town hall meeting um, on this project uh, at the Camarillo Library. Uh, it was with the mayor, and there were just two of us, so I assure you there were no Brown Act issues. Um, I think that Mr. Fox's uh, and Ms. McGovern's presentation not do I think, it, w it was even far more extensive uh, than this evening's presentation, much more so than tonight. Uh, there were many residents uh, from the neighborhood, from the adjacent neighborhoods there. Uh, they asked some very good, intelligent questions, uh, and I appreciate very much the level of community engagement, local community engagement, um, uh, with respect to this project. Um, the way that evening went and the way this evening has gone has provided me personally with a very high level of confidence uh, regarding this project, particularly as to safety, and safety is uh, number one. And the way I approach that, um, the chemicals that Ms. McGovern and Mr. Fox have spoken of are very, are very uh, common uh, to, to treatment pro uh, processes used in plants all over our country. And after 30 plus years of an environmental law practice advising public entities on treatment plants in both wastewater and water uh, matters, uh, I can assure you that we take that very seriously. Uh, and uh, I, am, um, uh, uh, I am always uh, looking at that from that aspect. Um, I'm very supportive of the city's acquisition of site number four uh, from the high school district. I uh, believe it is a win-win for everyone involved. Uh, the project is an environmentally beneficial project. We live in an area where there is substantial uh, groundwater degradation, both on the Oxnard Plain and in our local groundwater basins, and I won't go into a long dissertation on it because that's what I spend most of my professional life doing is in terms of water issues locally. Uh, but this project accomplishes so much. It meets our TMDL requirements. It makes an improvement to water quality. Uh, it promotes reliability for our local population. Uh, it provides a key source of water uh, to the city 
uh, and uh, all of us, and school, schools and residents alike, uh, which is independently achieved and it decreases our reliance on state water in the event that there's a problem in the Delta. Uh, and that is key. Um, and again, from a reliability standpoint, uh, it is um, uh, a really terrific project. It comes with some costs, sure, but when you look at the twin and at the twin features of both reliability and quality in terms of a supply of water for the local population it is truly a win-win so i'm very support thank you for the opportunity to make a couple of observations i'm very supportive of this uh, and supportive of the acquisition of site number four from the district thank you mr morgan it's been a long journey we've been working on this for years uh, when i first got elected we look back at an old when the newspaper said, what do you expect is going to be the future, uh, future problem in the area? No one even thought about it. And I said, water. Because you've got to know new people are moving here. And you only have so many sources of water. Tony's summed it up quite well on every aspect on what we've done. But we, we look at this and say, it's going to be, it could be cheaper water. In fact, the longer we hold it and the more we pay the bonds off, it will be cheaper water. Staff. Anyway, which going to cost us less, or the same or less than the water we're getting right now. So we look at the long range and see what uh, the long range factors are. Water that we don't have to worry about, Delta's breaking. And I've taken a tour on that Delta tour and it shows you these islands. That's what Deltas are, by the way. Islands up there that let the, the San Joaquin and the Sacramento River come through and flow through. Keep back the water from the ocean. But that's why some of our water that we imported is salty. The water you're drinking can't be put out in that drain by itself because you've got too much salt in it. But we drink it. But that's because of that. Now, if this island breaks, you're going to have, I told you before, you're going to have a long, possibly a long time before we have water here. So we've been pushing this thing because we know that. And we know the potential of problems in the future. So I think that we can now start moving along uh, and get this thing built. And so we all can feel a little safer. A lot of communities that don't have brine water, those that can't do it, They've got to worry. Thousand Oaks, Simi Valley, well, Simi Valley, no. <laughs> Thousand Oaks, Moore Park, no, Moore Park got the same saline. But those next to the ocean would have to go to the ocean water. And that's much more expensive than this. So we're lucky in one way that we have a resource now that we can use and be beneficial to our community. And someone said something about where's the line going to go. Well, the line's already in the ground. If you have seen... A year and a half ago, two years ago, that line that was being built along Lewis Road, that was the brine line. It's in the ocean. So it's there, waiting for us to hook up. That's all. Thank you. Mrs. Craven? Well, I'm not going to say much because Mr. Tremblay and Mr. Uh, Morgan expressed everything very well. But we have been working on this a long, long time. In spite of the fact that some of you only heard about it a couple of months ago, um, when Bob Westdyke was our public works director, which was quite a few years ago, yeah. he hired Lucy, and he told me that he hired Lucy to uh, get our our uh, brine, to get our brine line to get our desalter built. Lucy, how many years ago was that? <laughs> Fifteen years ago. Long time. That's how long ago we started working on this. Uh, we've had a test site, as the mayor said. Uh, I think I was the one who didn't like the taste of the water because it didn't have any taste whatsoever. <laughs> but I can get used to it. Uh, it'll be water and it'll be fresh. Sure. And uh, I can certainly support uh, directing staff to uh, move forward. Whatever it is, move place forward. a bid <laughs> on site four. Great, thank you. Mr. Kildee, anything to add? Uh, I won't add a whole lot other than to say that I, uh, this journey will continue. And uh, my feeling is it'll be a reliable uh, form of water, and hopefully we can keep our rates to the ratepayers at a reasonable level. And I appreciate the staff working with the residents uh, there. I appreciate the residents working with us. This is a team, and uh, I look forward to the future on this. Thank you. 
All right. Well, I think I've said most of what, what I needed to say and what, there's not much left to be said other than to say thank you. And again, thank you to our staff, to Mrs. McGovern, Mr. Fox. Um, it has been a long journey. We hope we're getting close to the end here. Um, two more years, hopefully, and we'll have a plant up and we'll be cutting a, cutting a ribbon and opening the door. But um, it, um, I think we've talked a lot about how much it's needed and hopefully we've done our homework. Um, I, after 15 years, we should have, um, have accomplished that and <coughs> looked at it. Um, all the sites certainly appreciate um, all of you working with us to try to get something that works for everybody, and we really do appreciate that. Madam, Madam Mayor, would it be a good time to uh, Absolutely. make a motion? Uh, I would move that uh, the council authorize staff to submit a purchase off offer to Oxnard Union High School District for site number four. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any other discussion? Mm -mm. Not, please vote. And that does pass unanimously. So thank you all for coming. You certainly can stay around if you'd like, but if not, we certainly understand you'd, if you'd <laughs> like to leave. Thank you. See ya. Thank you. Mm -hmm.